What do we know about J.D. Vance? Well, at least three things. One, he hates hillbillies. Two, he likes Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> and three, the only thing he hates more than the hillbillies he grew up around are the childless cat ladies all across America. Childless cat ladies is a term used by Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance to describe a certain demographic of women who choose pets and left-wing politics, for example, over traditional values like marriage and children. The problem is not that pets and politics are necessarily bad from a conservative perspective, but that they're replacements for more fulfilling things like children and religion. As soon as Vance's comments resurfaced, the media went into a frenzy, resurrecting their old rhetoric about how the Republicans are misogynistic and seeking to limit the hard-fought freedoms of women. They also coined a new label to characterize Vance's views, one that's proven to be the most difficult for the Republicans to counter. Weird. Personally, I'm not really interested in doing any political commentary, but I am curious. What does the Bible say about all of this? I'm sure a lot of people think that the Christian view would simply be that Vance is correct and that all women are meant to be in the home with the kids because that's just God's rule. But I'm willing to bet that it's at least a little bit more nuanced than that. On the sixth day of creation, God makes the first human. Adam is unique out of all the beasts because he's made out of the union of the Spirit of God and the dust of the earth, and is therefore a spiritual being with thought and language. Because he's rational, Adam is the ruler over all the animals and of the whole world, because he's the only creature who could rationally shape and guide the world towards the purpose God has for it. But a problem still needs to be solved. Adam is alone, without a suitable and equal partner. According to God himself, this situation situation is not good. But why is it not good? To answer this question, we need to know what it is to be good, or what goodness itself is. As Christians, we believe that the good is God as such, so that for something to be good means it is like God. And this is why Adam without an equal partner is not good. He is not like God, who is eternally with his equal partners as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, God creates Eve for Adam so that he can have an equal partner to exist in union with. But Eve isn't created the same way Adam is, but instead, she's made out of his own side. Why? Because Adam is meant to have an equal partner in order to be like the Holy Trinity, which is to say, he must have a partner of the same nature. God the Father eternally begets God the Son and spirates God the Spirit from out of his own paternal being, and so the Son and Spirit possess the fullness of the divine nature. Adam, as the image of God, allows God to create Eve out of his own self, and so she possesses the fullness of Adam's human nature. So amidst all the jibber-jabber about feminism and weirdos and the godforsaken brats, the Christian teaching on the purpose of human beings, male and female, is clear. We are meant to cling to our partners of the opposite sex and be fruitful and multiply. No exceptions. Well, it's a bit more complicated, but not for feminist reasons, for eschatological ones. But before we get to eschatology, we first need to get through protology. We need to go back to the first humans. Adam and Eve were meant to exist in communion with each other and with God. In the Bible, this is symbolically depicted as the marriage and wedding feast of God and man, an eschatological marriage that is symbolized by human marriages. When a man is married to his wife, they both cling to each other and depart from their family homes to live together. Likewise, when we're married to Christ the bridegroom, we cling to him and depart from our old way of life. It's fitting or good for us to be spiritually married to Jesus not only because he's a person we can know and speak with, but because by his free choice, he took on human nature so he could meet us at our own level. But animals are not equal with us in this respect, so we're not meant to cling to them as if they were. But as soon as we begin carefully reading the third chapter of Genesis, we notice that something's off. Man and women are meant to cling to each other, and this point was especially emphasized by God creating Eve after Adam and the animals. We learn that it is not good for humans to be partners with beasts. But in the very first verses of Genesis 3, we see Eve face to face in dialogue with the serpent, the most crafty of the beasts. And to make matters worse, Adam doesn't seem to be present. Man, the serpent sure was crafty knowing to tempt Eve when Adam wasn't there. But then we keep reading, and we see that immediately after Eve eats the fruit, 
she hands it to her husband. This implies that Adam was in fact present since the evil conversation began, but he chose to remain silent. This is the spiritual equivalent of cuckolding. It's as if you were to let another man seduce your wife right in front of you. So the serpent didn't even bother waiting until Eve was alone to tempt her. And yet, the text starts off by giving us the impression that she is alone in order to emphasize Adam's failure to speak up. Contrary to a lot of the more resentful anti-feminists out there, man, not woman, is primarily at fault for their fall. If you read Genesis 2 carefully, you'll notice that God gives the commandment to Adam not to eat of the tree of knowledge before the creation of Eve. This is important because the ethical teaching of the Bible is that you're guilty for rebelling against God in proportion to your knowledge of his law. And while Eve heard it secondhand from Adam, Adam heard it directly from God himself. While Eve is deceived, Adam consciously transgresses God's commandment in the face of the serpent's temptation. Now I said all of this because it relates to the current controversy. My bet is that in order to understand the modern phenomenon of childless cat ladies, we first need to understand the ancient phenomenon of childless serpent ladies. The serpent in Genesis 3 is a biblical figure who you may know as the devil or Satan. The devil is an angelic being, and this is actually alluded to in the Hebrew term for serpent, which as a noun means serpent, but as an adjective means bright, and the bright one, or Lucifer, is another name for Satan. The same is true of the word seraph, from which comes seraphim, meaning fiery or burning ones. As a noun, seraph means serpent, but as an adjective, it means burning. This shows that ancient Hebrew closely linked angels and serpents. There's lots more that could be said here, but for our purposes, it'll suffice to emphasize the fact that the devil appears as a beast or wild animal in Genesis 3. Genesis 2 ended with Eve being created so man could have a suitable partner, but in Genesis 3, Eve is with an unsuitable beastly partner. His goal is to turn both Adam and Eve away from God so that they would become subject to him, children of the devil instead of children of God. By listening to the word of the serpent over the word of God, Adam and Eve defile their marriage with God and celebrate a symbolic wedding feast or communion meal with a wild beast. The consequence of this event was the alienation of man and woman, who no longer cling to each other in perfect union. When they eat of the tree of knowledge, they see their own nakedness, and in the presence of each other they become ashamed. They presumably then spent many hours weaving fig leaves into garments to cover their nakedness, creating a physical barrier between their bodies and everything outside. Notice what's happening. God created man and woman to exist in union with each other, but they've become separated and are creating more barriers between each other. Not only that, but Adam seems to harbor some resentment against Eve and perhaps even God himself, telling him that the woman you gave me is the cause of his fall. And now, fast forward 6,000 years, give or take, and instead of Adam blaming Eve, we have J.D. Vance blaming the cat ladies. And yet, isn't the biblical view on the cat lady stuff clearly Vance's? Well, yes and no. In general, we agree with him that women, but also men, can't live a good and fulfilled life with pets, politics, or really anything coming before family, friends, and God. On the other hand, Vance's notion that the childless cat ladies are the active agents taking over corporate America and the Democratic Party, aside from being questionable on factual grounds, it misses the biblical point that these ladies, while free and responsible agents, are usually, and to varying degrees, deceived by the political, social, and institutional realities created and upheld mostly by men. Like Eve, these women are deceived into believing they ought to seize power and autonomy for themselves, when they're really being manipulated for ulterior reasons such as corporate profit or political power. And like Eve, many if not most of these women lack a suitable male figure in their lives who will raise his voice against the lies of this world. On the opposite side, it seems like the temptation for men is either to conform with feminism and everything that comes with it, or go far to the other side and, like Adam, resentfully blame women for all their problems. The way the Trump campaign has embodied these two aspects of Adam's sin is truly a sight to behold, with the 
feminism and diversity nonsense of the RNC being immediately followed by the media firestorm over Vance blaming childless cat ladies for America's ills. And so, both political parties don't have the answers, because both are actively contributing to the divisions of male and female and other identities that led to all our problems in the first place. In fact, the solution to the problems of our society is not first political, but begins as a transformation of persons. This transformation occurs in Christ, in whom there is no male and female, as all is forgiven and all are one in Christ Jesus. And that's because throughout this whole video, what we've really been concerned with is the meaning of male and female and how each attains to the purpose God created for them. While marriage and children are blessed, they are not, as some conservatives imply, the only suitable lifestyle of either man or woman. And that's because the true purpose for which God created all things is union with Jesus Christ. But in order to fulfill this purpose, there must be the multiplication of humanity. Thus, the will of God seems to be that most women, at least at this point in history, dedicate themselves to marriage and motherhood. But against certain reactionary reasoning, this isn't because women are just bags of flesh meant to produce more flesh for the benefit of the state. But you know what else more than one wife will give you? It'll give you children faster. But because motherhood is a lofty calling through which God works through the mother to share even more of his life with the world. But some women and men may be called to a celibate life in order that they may cling to Christ alone without any worldly distractions, sharing his eternal life through prayer and good works. And so, in Christ, even the childless cat ladies are holy.